Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Conducting Depositions Online, What You Need to Know. Today's webinar is brought to you by Legal Fuel, the Practice Resource Center of the Florida Bar and Esquire Deposition Solutions. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. We'll be recording this webinar and we'll share the link after the event. The recording and any supporting resources will also be posted to our website, legalfuel.com. Any questions you may have during today's presentation can be asked through the Q&A feature, which you'll find down at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom control panel. Our presenters will do the best to answer any questions you have. However, due to time constraints, they may not be able to address all of them. Today's presentation has been approved by the Florida Bar for one hour of general CLE credit and one hour of technology. The course number for this presentation is 2002-332-N as in Nancy. And now I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Hallie Peters is a licensed Florida attorney with almost 10 years of experience, including litigating nationwide class actions and representing financial institutions against customer claims in security, securities matters. At Esquire, Hallie provides over 300 law firms and corporations with the legal technology and expertise to efficiently and effectively manage the discovery and deposition process. She currently serves as a committee chair on the Technology Committee of the Florida Bar and was elected vice president of the Junior League of Miami. Hallie graduated magna cum laude from the University of Miami School of Law and earned her undergraduate degree from the University of Michigan. Karen Cespedes is a complex litigation consultant for Esquire Deposition Solutions. With more than 14 years in the legal industry, Ms. Cespedes, a former State Department fellow, has significant experience establishing strategic corporate partnerships, implementing consultative litigation strategies, and collaborating with legal professionals, law firms, and Fortune 500 companies. Karen sits on the CABA Pro Bono Board of Directors and serves as its secretary, as well as the Florida Bar's Citizens Advisory Committee and the Florida Bar's 11th Circuit Grievance Committee. Karen is a world ahead graduate from the Florida International University. She graduated with a master's in international relations and East Asian studies. Enjoy today's presentation. Thank you, Jonathan. Welcome everyone. Again, my name is Hallie Peters. Thank you so much for joining us and let's begin. So the reason why we're here, we'd like to give you an opportunity to understand the whys behind remote technology. Why is remote deposition technology important? and also enable you with some things that you may or may not have thought of already. We'd like to arm you with this information so you can intelligently discuss remote technology with opposing counsel, clients, your legal teams, and the court system, and explain why we need to do this in the practicalities of our world today. First, we'll talk about what litigating looks like in this new abnormal. We'll understand the rules governing remote depositions, will understand the remote services that are available for online proceedings and record capture. And we'll talk about the practicalities and what services are available and prepare you for a remote deposition before, during, and after. Next slide, please. So these are living, where you're living in unprecedented times. I'm sure I don't need to say that anymore, but the new abnormal is anything but normal. We really are dealing with local, state, and federal guidelines and orders that are restricting commercial activity in, in many different areas, of course. And now we're seeing the diff different states starting to open back up, we're seeing the divides between essential and non-essential businesses. But luckily, lucky for us as litigators, we are considered essential, um, but many of us are now working from home. Almost 70% of law firms in the United States have been working from home. So social distancing has been implemented and we are all trying to respect that as much as possible. Because what is at stake? Every single state has issued some type of order addressing the situation at hand and every single one has talked about the concern for court backlogs. The backlogs are going to, they're being exacerbated with the inability of people to litigate within the different courts. In addition to that, protecting your client's cases. As a litigator, we are, by under the rules, here to zealously represent our clients and ensure that their cases are going forward. If just stalling a case and waiting until this ends is not really an option anymore. Additionally, the firm and attorney business continuity. How has your firm reacted to this? 
Are you considering the cybersecurity and uh, cybersecurity concerns from working from home? Uh, how are you going to maintain a revenue stream? I mean, I think every single day I'm getting many articles above the law, law.com that are just addressing how law firms are handling this, whether it's furloughs, whether it's changing the summer associate schedule, whether it's firing some people in some cases. So there's a lot of an interest into how firms are going to continue with their businesses. And then there's essential cases that must be heard, due process concerns, emergency hearings, and then of course, the health and safety of the members of the court system. How are we going to effectively start litigating again and bringing everyone back safely? But as a litigator, as I mentioned, sitting on the sidelines is not an option. The landscape is constantly changing, but one thing is clear, we can't just sit back and wait till this is over to continue our cases. The courts have also realized that and have opened up to the use of video conferencing and remote technology in a way that we've never seen before. Also, next slide, please. Also, the litigation trends. The good news, I will say, I think as this, as this pandemic subsides, we will see so much more litigation I mean, we're already seeing litigation regarding business interruption, insurance claims, voters' rights, the cures and preventions, the different types of hand sanitizers are even being sued. Of course, price gouging and the failure to refund, whether it's airlines, concerts, different events, there's a lot of issues right now with companies refunding different purchases of tickets. Of course, cruise lines are also seeing this type of litigation. And then governmental action or emergency matters. In Florida, we, the government's being sued for not closing the beaches soon enough. There's a lot of land use actions across the nation here in Florida, especially in, in Michigan as well. And then we'll see, we're seeing the client company needs. So how, has, how have companies dealt with bankruptcy, restructuring, employment claims, of course, people not having the ability to work and they're being laid off, Cybersecurity, as I mentioned, making sure that your business continuity plan is in place and being implemented, healthcare, and crisis management. So how are we going to keep, next slide please. So how are we going to keep our cases moving in the new abnormal? There's an excellent article, I highly recommend reading it. The site is right there. As a litigator, this is, it's really how to make sure that your cases are going forward, it's very clear. The source is at the bottom. Um, the balance, the reasonable accommodations with moving your cases forward. At this time, as a litigator, yes, you're considered a pit bull in most instances. You're fighting for your client, zealously representing them. However, we have to remember empathy. We have to remember proceeding with empathy, understanding when there are problems or you know, every single person is experiencing this pandemic in different ways. Just be respectful, be professional. You can, of course, agree to reasonable adjournments and keep the deadline short, make sure you're keeping track of them. And for litigants that are pushing back or who seek delay for strategic gain, it's more important now than ever to ensure that your cases are going forward to actually have the discussion with counsel. Why are you delaying? What is your reasoning? Make sure you get that in writing. If this continues to be a problem, don't be scared to go to the courts and ask for direction or guidance file a motion as to, we need, I need this case to go forward. And judges, you don't want to be the litigant who's holding up a case because of technology or you feel like you can't conduct the depositions. In California, just recently, a judge truly, I actually felt bad for this litigant. The lawyer had been delaying, been delaying, and the judge just berated him. It's not something that judges are patient for that they're willing to allow anymore. Of course, don't be afraid and make sure that you, again, are having the opposing counsel or whoever's trying to delay the case have their explanation in writing. And then don't let the perfect be the enemy of good. Of course, in-person depositions are considered the ideal. They're perfect, that's, that's what you'd want to do. But video conferencing is good. It may not be perfect, but it's what we have to work with. And the more that you practice with it, the more comfortable that you get, the easier it becomes. And it's not going away. Courts are actually adopting it more. So even after this pandemic, I predict it will become more of the normal. Next slide, please. So we've just discussed the practicalities, why we're here. And now we'll talk briefly about the rules 
there are the laws that existed and the rules that existed and how they have changed from federal to state and of course Florida's a more in-depth look. So the pandemic clearly has acted as a catalyst for nearly every state to issue court orders regarding corona, generally encouraging the legal community to utilize remote technology. What we're seeing is that court orders are encouraging parties to do things remotely, of course, and every state is issuing orders that relax the rules of civil procedure, any rule that is prohibiting or restricting the use of technology. As an example, a number of states, like, including Florida, have adopted such orders with, again, the same goals, ensuring the health and safety of the litigants and the court system, and proceeding when possible with cases by using remote technology, and of course, professionalism. Next slide, please. So first, the federal rules. What do the rules say about remote depositions? Well, rule 29 stipulations, this will allow the parties to stipulate by means which the proceeding will be conducted. Obviously that provides for you to discuss with counsel, a stipulate prior to the proceeding. Yes, we both agree. And then at the proceeding, get that on the record. Um, that's been a norm under the federal rules. And then rule 30B, four and five, Many states have adopted this standard already. As we know, remote depositions have been being conducted in many states that follow this rule. And if you look at the comments into the amendments, you'll see this expressly eliminates the necessity of the presence of one whose only function is to administer the oath. Meaning, you don't need a court reporter physically present with the witness to administer the oath. And with many, while well, many states, next slide please. So while many states have adopted the federal rules, or very similar rules, many have, many, or a handful had not. So as you'll see the list, that these states have had, adopt, had to adopt special rules to provide for the remote swearing in of witnesses. This eliminates and suspends the in-person requirements, thereby permitting the remote swearing in and remote depositions. As of today, and as a result of COVID, now remote oaths and remote depositions are permitted in all 50 states. Next slide. In Florida, what did our rules say? Of course, Florida did not follow the federal rules exactly, and it does require that the, uh, to whom the deposition be taken must be put the witness on oath, and that the witness must be sworn by a person present with the witness who is qualified to administer an oath at, in that location. That is the in-person requirement that we, as litigators, have always grappled with in Florida. And for several years, oh, sorry. The Florida Attorney General, the order issued an opinion clearly that requires the oath to be administered in the physical presence of the witness. This Attorney General opinion, yes, while it provides for the potential opportunity for video conferencing, the AG went on to state, it, but I'm not going to go as far as to say the in-person requirement is gone, but it may be advisable to seek legislative or judicial clarification through the crafting of legislation or rules to accomplish this. And fast forward for several years, next slide please. For several years, Florida attorneys have been lobbying and lobbying and pushing to amend the rules to provide for remote swearing in with video and audio equipment in part, not just because the technology is becoming available, but the cost concerns and the other considerations that have promoted remote reporters in so many states. Also the court reporter shortage. It, nationwide, the shortage of court reporters is a serious problem. So this is not a new argument. However, they could not ever agree really on what the rule should say, the different committees, um, the different attorneys that were vying for this. So it took a pandemic <laughs> for a, a rule to be agreed upon. This actually, I'm, I am proud to say Esquire did have a hand in this and was, did email and provide the verbiage that we now see in the emergency order, which now permits remote OS and requested on March 16th. Two days later on March 18th, the Florida Supreme Court did enter the rule permitting remote swearing in and further expanding the acceptance and adoption of remote technology in a number of proceedings. What does that emergency order say? I strongly encourage you, if you have not been doing this already, to follow the Supreme Court, Florida Supreme Court website. 
it says, I think COVID or Corona, follow the orders that are coming in. Every single day it's differently. We've had to update this slide, I think, two or three times just in the last couple of weeks. Um, but on March 18th, as I mentioned, the administrative order 2016 was entered. The order has now been extended three times and then a fourth order extending parts of it and then also reinforcing the fact that it will expire unless another order prolongs it on May 29th, 2020. Um, again, this is the goals, the same goals that we've been hearing again and again, uh, maintain the judicial workflow, the extent feasible, make sure that the judges in all the different circuits are considering the use of remote technology for their proceedings. And again, now the bullet point two, the important part for us here today is that a person qualified to administer the oath in the state of Florida, so court reporter, notary, may swear a witness remotely by audio video communication technology from a location within Florida, provided they can positively identify the witness. That part is important, provided they can positively identify the witness. That means the court reporter or notary has to be able to see and hear the witness. Unfortunately, under telephonic depositions, you cannot remotely swear in the witness because of the, the need to see them, to hear them. They oftentimes, what the witness will do is hold up their identification to the, the camera, and then the court reporter is able to administer the oath that reflects this, the latest Florida Supreme Court orders, and get that on the record before the proceeding uh, can proceed. And this is, this is great for us, though. It does open the door for the remote swearing in and the remote depositions. So, and again, all the rules of civil procedure, any other order, opinion, that limits or prohibits the use of audio video communication equipment to administer oaths shall remain suspended. Next slide, please. And Florida looks ahead. So in addition to co consistently updating and extending the order that promotes the use of technology and also the remote swearing in, the Florida Supreme Court Justice Kennedy also established the continuity work group to assess the current COVID-19 situation and re recommend next steps. This is so important because this hopefully will provide for the rules to actually be changed in perpetuity um, and eliminate the requirement that everything be conducted, that certain proceedings and that swearing in be conducted in person. So what is this task force? 17 different members from around Florida, mostly judges, and they're tasked with a literally like a really excellent, very thorough list of what what, they, what just Justice Kennedy and the Florida Supreme Court wants them to do. They want them to examine the current status and where warranted, find ways that promote the use of remote technology that can help the court backlog and see, make sure that we're still using the technology to the best of our ability, even after the pandemic. Identify and propose solutions uh, for legal issues and challenges and the costs associated with the, remote, the use of remote technology. Uh, one thing I, I hear a lot from my clients okay, my witness doesn't have access to remote uh, videos. He doesn't have a computer. He doesn't have a smartphone. What are we going to do here? Um, one one core, the 4th the DCA in Broward, actually has computers outside. So the witness, and it's one computer for one person. The other people aren't allowed in those rooms. The, the witness is able to go, be heard for the hearings, and then go away. I'm sure a lot of other courts are figuring, and hopefully will, um, around Florida, we'll figure out different ways to provide the technology necessary. And then also uh, court reporting firms that we have our offices, once we are able to reopen them. I mean, Miami, most offices are still open, um, ours is, but the Aventura has been closed, Fort Lauderdale, a number of other offices have been. But going forward, hopefully we'll be able and other offices will be able to be open so that they can, we can provide the platform for the witness to appear remotely. On proposed guidance, of course, this is incredibly important. Oh, go back. Here, go back one slide. Um, of course, proposed guidance um, and what we're going to do in the future. And then recommend and priority which proceedings that require in-person hearings and trials should resume. And then identify which proceedings may continue to be held remotely even after the public health emergency has passed. This is, again, so important. Very happy that Justice Kennedy is getting out before this, before anything, before the pandemic ends, because this is here to stay, and we will be using remote technology much more often. And again, the purpose of this, we need to re reduce the court backlog 
I'm sure all of us have experienced that in our practice. Um, and this will definitely help solve that problem. Next slide. And this work group is on point. Just on May 4th, so the work group was established on April 21st. May 4th, the emergency order that was entered by Justice Kennedy was based on the recommendations of this task force. So they got straight to work. They are, they are now allowing the many proceedings in state court that had already went remote, those will remain. And then they added a bunch of different proceedings to the list. So this is extremely important. Um, this is the list, it's not exhaustive, it's not the entire list. I urge you again, go to the Florida Supreme Court website um, and look at these emergency orders in, in particular. So I'll highlight a few that I think will be relevant to you. Um, again, that, the list is not exhaustive, but the non-jury trials, they can be remote, except the parties must agree to remote non-jury proceedings in criminal, juvenile delinquency and termination TPR um, cases, alternative dispute resolution cases, status, case management, and pretrial conferences in all case types. So no longer will you be going to a case management conference that lasts forever <laughs> and you, you're able not to do that from the luxury of your office or your home. Um, and they will, the, most courts are using Zoom, so that's exciting. Um, and the non-evidentiary uh, evidentiary motion hearings in all case types. So this is important as we consider like presenting the evidence, how do, we, how do we do that? How do we get electronic exhibits? How are we going to present them to everyone, including any witnesses that you have, or how do you prep your witnesses for these hearings? It's very important. Um, and then the others, I will let you read at your leisure, but it's a very good sign. This group is already getting to work and they will take off the to-do list one by one and we'll definitely be seeing a lot more remote. Next slide, please. And so the sample language, again, it's not legal advice, but <laughs> under the temporary order, we do have a sample, sample notice language um, that's for remote depositions. Um, again, include this, include something up to the same effect. And then we have the sample stipulation that you can always update it with the most recent administrative order that's in place. So bookmark that Supreme Court website I keep mentioning. And this is the stipulation that you can have with opposing counsel or your co-counsel, whomever you're discussing this with, the remote um, sample stipulation language is there. Next slide, please. And remote depositions aren't new. So there's a difference. The remote reporter just is, the, rem the remote reporter is something that's new in Florida because of the allowance now of the remote swearing in. But remote depositions, Zoom depositions, video conferencing depositions, have we've been doing those forever, <laughs> it seems. Um, the technology that makes the depositions really easy, convenient. You can go, you can have your expert witness who lives in Timbuktu come to the deposition, attend, have your associate zoom in so they get the experience, see what's going on without the cost of having to actually pay the hourly, to have them sitting there. They can also be in their office prepared with the exhibits and the other documents that might be important to your case. This also helps a lot with plaintiffs that are, and other witnesses that may not be readily accessible or easy to track down. There's really, there's not really an excuse to say, I can't do a video conference for the next month. There is an excuse, I can't fly to Miami, I live in Washington, I can't do that. Okay, try the remote option. Um, also, it reduces travel, uh, I think, Everyone can say as an attorney, especially young attorneys. So for those of you out there, this is for you. <laughs> um, the work-life balance. It is very tough as attorneys to have a healthy work-life balance, but using remote technology really helps. And judges are actually embracing it as well because they're able to hold motion calendar there using remote technology and still get through the cases that they've been waiting, they're waiting to get through. It's a good thing. Um, and the remote participation by client and legal teams, I touched on that. And then electronic exhibits. You're going to save money on copying and shipping, or if you are traveling for a deposition, printing out all those exhibits, bringing your rolly cart, bringing two extra suitcases. Attorneys, I've seen them do it. It's not necessary anymore. And the difference is not great. If you practice, 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 test, test, test. <laughs> But I will say, and not 
not to scare you, proceed with caution. It takes, go ahead, it takes more than a webcam and an internet connection to safely and securely conduct a deposition and can capture the record. And with that, I will transition to my colleague, Karen. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Hallie. I'll spend the remainder of the webinar discussing remote depositions, what they are, and what happens before, during, or after. I will review the different stages of prep and break down what you and the court reporting agency need to do in order to ensure a smooth proceeding. So let's begin by defining the difference between remote deposition and remote court reporting services. Again, first there is remote deposition services, which means that one or more attendees can attend remotely, but the court reporter is always with the witness. And then we have remote court reporting services, which is where we are now, and that is when the reporter is apart from the witness. With each, there is an option of adding the following. So real-time reporting, which means that we have a live transcription of the deposition by the reporter. Remote videographer, who records and captures the record. And then also remote interpreter. So, and then finally, the paperless and diskless delivery of the final transcript, exhibits and video via secure online repositories. So what makes remote court reporter services different? It really boils down to that the reporter, again, is not in the same location as the witness. As you've heard from Hallie, in some states, this has been available for years, but with the current pandemic, this service now means that every one of us is remote. And with that, your preparation, the procedures that you prepare for, and the proceeding itself must change. So let's start with the court reporter. What is their role now? The remote reporter's role should remain traditional. The primary exception now is that you will see them as a participant on your screen and then um, and that their role with the exhibits has changed. But the reporter continues, just like before, to swear in the deponent, take the record, perform readbacks as requested, control the proceedings, and then of course, manages and receives the exhibit, though now they're doing that electronically. There are some functions, though, that the agency should never place, should not place on the remote court reporter's shoulders. The, re the reporter should not be responsible for downloading or sharing exhibits during the proceeding. They should not be responsible for pausing the record for or any off the record comments. And most importantly, they should not be considered tech support for technology based questions. For this, you should be able to hand off these questions and issues to the agency. Because again, these actions would take away from the court reporter and the role that you want them to play, the reason why you have them there. And that is to take down the record verbatim. So while the role of the court reporter remains somewhat traditional, the way they carry out the role remotely is anything but. With all parties, including the witness, in a different location, your remote reporter should be trained to work in a different way. These are new times. So, they, so ask these questions. What kind of training did they receive from their court reporting agency? Do they have a clear idea of their roles and responsibility? Who is available to support your court reporter before, during, or after the deposition so that they can focus on the proceeding itself? And how long has the agency been doing remote reporting? Did they just introduce this in response to COVID or do they truly have the experience? With, and as well as with all parties in different locations, handling confidential documents, 
is their infrastructure and their data handling procedures secure? Is their staff trained in document security? Because as you'll see, the core reporting um, isn't the only, the core reporter is not the only one who needs support. Because the support begins before the deposition, right? Because success lies in the preparation of it all. First and most important, you must make sure that all parties, and especially the witness, have the correct technology in order to participate in the remote proceeding. The witness is important because while attorneys have the technology, it's not a sure thing that witnesses do. And in this scenario, a court reporter cannot bring a laptop or an iPad to the witness like we used to do before. So what is needed to take the remote proceeding? You're gonna need a computing device, right? So a Windows computer or a Mac, an iPad, a good a set of speakers, a good microphone. In short, you gotta approach this as if you were preparing to record this deposition for trial. And most critical of all is the bandwidth of your internet. We recommend that you plug your computer to your router if possible, but if not, then prepare your home office for a wireless deposition. We will discuss this and I'll go into more detail about this as we move forward. So how do the attorney and the team prepare? First, we gotta make sure that all team members and attending parties have the equipment and the bandwidth required. Next, you gotta include the language in the notice discussing and disclosing the preceding methodology. You gotta state that this will be a video conference, that the witness will be sworn in remotely, and add any stipulations if necessary. Then, you got to be sure you have prepared your exhibits to be shared electronically. You got to make sure that you determine who on the team will share the documents and also make sure that they have the documents in one easy to access location on their computer's local drive and not on a network or a document management system. You know, now more than ever, Law firms are le leveraging their paralegals and leaving the document handling to them during the deposition. I'm seeing more and more paralegals sit in on the depositions with their role being exclusively to share the docs or the exhibits. So in that way, the attorney is focused on taking the deposition itself. But even if you don't have a paralegal or an associate to step in, you can easily introduce and share exhibits yourself. You just have to prepare beforehand. You have to make sure that you're comfortable using the share features of the video conferencing platform, and a good agency will help you with that. And then would, they would also make themselves available for training. And finally, and most importantly, use the same equipment that you've tested with um, the day of the deposition. Last minute switches are as risky as the sound and we've all been there. <laughs> now, I'm transitioning over to Hallie, who's gonna lead us on in these following slides. Thank you, Karen. So next, the witness rules and how to prep your witness. This is actually one of my favorite parts of this because it's really going to be so important and it's make or break. Uh, we've experienced some witnesses that may be driving in their car when they're being deposed or smoking or it's, it's incredible what we have seen. And this is why it's so important to listen and pay attention to this witness prep. So you're going to go through this with your witness beforehand, hopefully maybe opposing counsel will as well, but this is important to prepare them, but then at the actual deposition, whether it's your witness or not, going through these questions and getting the answers on the record. So positioning, obviously, you want to be able to see their hands, you want them to be far farther a bit away from the, the video, their body language, you wanna make sure that they're going to be sitting up straight, uh, the communication, that they're aware that they can communicate during breaks, but how are you going to communicate during breaks? 
Of course, if you're using video technology, you don't want to necessarily do that. The chat function, probably not a good idea, or if it's even available, depending on the platform that you're using. Um, are you going to call them? Make sure that the video is muted, but agree to what you're going to do. If they have a landline, you're going to use that prior to the deposition. During the deposition, of course, they want to, you want to confirm that no one else is in the room. In fact, I think one good way to do this is saying, okay, please take your camera, show it around the room and tell your witness that this is going to happen so that they can be prepared and that if they're in a room that's clean, tidy, not, not hoarder or anything like that. So prepare them like that and get that on the record. And if someone is going to come into the room, make sure that you get the, the witness to agree. Okay, if someone comes into the room, you have to announce, have them announce their name and get them on camera. Okay, get, the, yeah, get them on camera. Um, then a witness has to agree not to communicate with anyone during the dish deposition. Um, I also ask witnesses like, turn off other running platforms, any emails, turn it off, phone, turn it off, um, any recording devices that they may have. And definitely, definitely like having the phone right here, if your witness keeps looking down, if you even suspect that there is some coaching going on, definitely get it on the record first. And then at a later date after the proceeding, you can always subpoena the device for the communication records. So uh, we had an attorney, he was, uh, he was suspecting that his witness was doing that texting the whole time. He repeatedly asked the witness, are you texting someone? Are, are you texting someone? No, no, no. Gets it on the record multiple times. After the proceeding, subpoenas the cell phone records. He was communicating with counsel the entire deposition. That does not look pretty. And you have to make sure it's on the record though, so that later on you can use it and be aware of it. Next, exhibits. So this has been a very important hot topic with all of our clients, uh, lawyers. It's a scary thing. Again, what Karen had said, it's all about prep. This is not going to be a deposition that you can show up with the important documents to your case and go through them. That's not the way that these depositions can be conducted. So you really have to plan ahead. Um, I definitely recommend having one dedicated folder on your desktop, put all the exhibits, label them, exhibit one, exhibit two, exhibit three. If you do need to introduce new exhibits at the proceeding, we can, we'll, I'll, mention, I'll explain how that happens, but don't worry if it's not in that folder at exactly at that time, because you can still introduce new documents during the proceeding. So what, how you decide this, you can, there's two main ways. You can email or provide the exhibits prior to the proceeding to all involved and the court reporter. That's great. We always want that if you're prepared and ready. Um, and then also that's important though, if you're the type of witness that you have, is this going to be a witness that's authenticating documents? You're going to want that witness to have the documents before. If this is a witness that's favorable to you, they're on your side and you're not worried at all about any witness coaching prior to, then more like often than not, it's okay to email the exhibits to everyone involved, maybe share them on Box or Dropbox, however you feel is safest, but always considering the cybersecurity concerns. Um, but that's the initial way. And then during the proceeding, okay, everyone, let's go to exhibit one. Can you go back here? Um, and then the other way is that if the element of surprise is important, so this is like the witnesses that you want to impeach their credibility, or if you think that they're going to get the documents, go straight to counsel and coach, get coached, and it's then you have a high risk of that, definitely err on the side of introducing the exhibits at the proceeding. You can do that in a number of ways. Um, and to do that, you can share your screen, which Karen will get into a bit more in depth. Share your screen with whatever platform that your agency is using, whether it's Zoom or WebEx or whatever you'd like to use. Again, having your computer clean, tidy, just like your office, I'm sure it is. Um, the exhibits are there in one folder, labeled one, two, three, and you're able to pull them up. PDFs are fine. Any type of file with Zoom you can pull up and even have your witness manipulate it using the different tools and mark it up. Again, Karen will get into that. You can also share it um, via the chat feature, which Karen will get into as well. So how are you going to mark them up? There's a number of self-stamping solutions that are really low, low cost if your firm doesn't have one already um, for PC and Mac. The Adobe Acrobat Reader DC, that's what I found most attorneys that I work with are using. 
Um, it does, it, you just pull up the document and it, it stamps it prior to. And then also exhibitstickers.com. You can add the digital exhibit stickers directly to your PDF. I'm sure that there are other solutions out there. If you're marking them up before, excellent. You're going to name them, you're going to number them, they're going to be there and you'll provide them to the court reporter and provide them to opposing counsel. If you have not had the opportunity to, or if you're introducing new documents during the proceeding, after the proceeding it is extremely important that you work with your agency to give them those exhibits in a timely fashion, at least within the 24 hours after the proceeding, so that the court reporter can process them with the transcript and complete the entire transcript process and exhibit process and get them back to you. Of course, the main concerns that we're hearing though are the annotation of documents. How do I get my witness to like mark this up? Depending on what platform that you're using, talk with the agency that you're working with because it's absolutely very easy and excellent to have the witness marking it up using the tools available on the platform that you choose. And then also managing voluminous documents. It is difficult to prepare for a remote remote deposition and when you have hundreds of exhibits. But there is technology that is there. Um, Box it has unlimited storage and you're able to pull up the exhibits easily. Everyone can see them, mark them up real time, and everyone can walk away with a set of actually marked up exhibits at the end of the deposition. And they're kept secure. Next slide, Karen. And agency prep with the parties. I'm going to turn it back to Karen. Thanks, Allie. So you've done your pre-check of your team and witness. They all have the technology they need and you've decided who will do the exhibit sharing and marking. So let's talk about the role of the court reporting agency in the preparation for the deposition. First, even though you have asked the right questions of the participants you control, the agency should test and validate the hardware and connection of all parties. Each test should take no more than five minutes and can be done one party at the time. The agency should make sure that, one, the equipment works correctly, that the webcam works, that the party can hear and speak clearly, that the bandwidth is good, and the picture and sound is smooth and clear. The agency should also confirm the optional preceding services that we discussed, right? So do you want real time? Do you want a remote videographer to capture this deposition? Do you want a remote interpreter? While this information was probably relayed and discussed during the initial request, it never hurts to double check to make sure that nothing fell through the cracks and that the day of the deposition, you have everything that you requested. Um, now, about the exhibits. The agency should discuss with you how you will share your exhibits during the proceeding, how you want them marked, and also how you will submit them to the reporter and make sure that you receive the training that you need to ensure a smooth proceeding. You need to feel comfortable. You need to test. You need to practice if you haven't used remote technology before. And now that we've done that, let's move on to the day of. So you've done all that, you're prepared. Now it's time to take that depot the day of the proceeding. We're gonna go back to what? Testing. <laughs> Before the proceeding begins, you know, take time for a final check. Enter the virtual room, if you can, at least 20 minutes ahead of time so that you make sure that nothing has changed, right? You're checking that your audio is clear, that the webcam works, that you can, be, you can see and be seen, that the video stream is healthy and smooth, and uh, that you have a good bandwidth, and we recommend a minimum of five megabytes per second. And there's also a, a website that you can go to, speedtest.net, which allows you the chance to actually check uh, the level of your bandwidth. And most importantly as well, make sure that you are closing all tabs, 
that all unnecessary applications are closed to free up your computer system resources as well as your wireless connection, right? So turn off the Wi-Fi in your iPhone. Um, all of these other things that are necessary in order to just ensure that you have a smooth uh, proceeding. And finally, let's focus on the all-important environment check. This is something we don't have to think about in our regular, in our past life. <laughs> but now in this new abnormal world, this is very important because the deposition is not happening in your law firm or at the office of the agency anymore. It's happening at your house. Or, uh, and it becomes critical to address this and check it all before you conduct the proceeding. So again, let's make sure that there's no unnecessary use of internet bandwidth, right? Including streaming video services like Netflix or Hulu. We're working now at home with our families. Like, let's make sure that the kids are not online, that, that we're maximizing all of our resources so that our bandwidth could be strong and healthy for our deposition. Also, make sure that you turn off your smart speaker, right? Turn off Alexa, um, as well as to make sure that you are positioned correctly for the proceeding with an uncluttered background, good lighting to show your face to the court reporter and others. So what we want of our witnesses is what we have to do ourselves. We're gonna make sure that we're facing the camera that the microphone is near your mouth, and we're gonna also make sure to confirm that we can, again, what, be clearly heard and be seen. And most importantly, dress for a deposition as you would have done before, right? And you're not dressing like you're, we're at home, but we're dressing professionally for a deposition. Remember, we are all together in the same room. And turn off that cell phone, any texting applications, hit the set the do not disturb, close the door, and if possible, make sure to keep a track on background noise. Um, so just to recap this, for the final check, let's, we should confirm that the exhibits are ready, that the presenter exhibit folder is open for fast access, that technology check is complete, that the environment check is complete. Those are the four cornerstones of a great remote deposition. Again, making sure that we know our exhibits are ready, making sure that we have access to our exhibits in case that we need to present during the deposition. Make sure that we completed our technology check and make sure that we're ready for our depot by doing the environment check. Also, confirm as well that your witness their environment check is completing. You know, we gotta recall what Hallie said earlier about others in the room and any communication uh, technology at hand being disclosed for the record. This is important. All parties should be on camera during the deposition as if they were in the room. This makes it easier for the court reporter to identify each of the parties for the record and see who is speaking to take down the record accurately. We also want to see that, we also want to see everyone just to make sure that everyone is behaving as well during our depot. So we've, com uh, we've confirmed that the exhibits are ready, the presenter exhibits are ready to go, that the environment check is completed, that the technology check is completed, and that you and your team have the video conference login information, link, and password. We've also uploaded exhibits in advance, if possible. We've also designated the exhibits that are gonna be shared during the time of the deposition, and we've done the technology check, environment check, as well as to confirm the, uh, the the um, the witnesses environment and check as well. I want, I'm highlighting this because this is a, the cornerstone principles to hosting a great remote deposition. If we don't check these off, then we're going to have a mess on our hands. 
and that deposition is not going to go as smooth as you would like it. On the other hand, the agency should also do the final check. They also got to make sure that everybody who was invited to the deposition, including opposing counsel or anyone else who will be participated, has signed on, can be clearly seen, and they have to remain available on call to the court reporter if there is any questions and to serve as tech support. Remember, you don't want the court reporter to be your exhibit manager or your tech support. That's the role. The tech support is the role of the agency. So here we are. The proceeding has begun. What are some of the best practices and what should your court reporter be doing? Here are some best practices when it comes to remote audio and video, right? So mute your sound if you're not speaking, right? We're gonna turn your video on and keep it on. You make sure that you can see the reporter and make sure that they can see you. If you have trouble hearing or being heard, use the test application most video conference, um, conferencing software programs provide and check that or switch to another audio input device, either the computer or the phone. So I'm using, I've patched into the audio through my phone, just in case that I have, to, just in case if I have any wireless issues, I'm still connected to this video conference, right? I still have the opportunity to, if disconnected, I can log right, back right in and I'm still connected to the deposition. So what should you expect from the core reporter during the deposition? You will recognize all these bullets because again, th these items have always been part of their primary responsibility. So the core reporter will initiate the proceeding and they'll start the record. They'll request the counsel to identify themselves and state who they represent again for the record. They will ask all other persons to identify themselves as well, including anyone who might be in the room with the witness. They will add to the record anyone who joins late. They will swear in the witness with the option of confirming with counsel before swearing in the witness in that the remote oath has the same force and effect as if done in person and reading in or any stipulation agreed upon in advance with the taking attorney. They will also record the entry and exit of all parties unrelated, uh, unrelated to loss of connection and they will stop the proceeding if anyone drops the connection so that no one misses any of the important testimony. This is our new abnormal, right? And our new abnormal, this fully virtual environment that we live in does not lend itself to the core reporter handling exhibits. There is no way to slide the paper that exhibit across the table. However, the process of sharing and distributing documents to others at the proceeding is pretty simple and straightforward. The counsel or the person that we've designated that council has designated can use the platform share screen function to share new exhibits and give everyone a description of the document and its exhibit number. The required formats of the exhibit depend on the video conferencing software that you're using and most brands will allow you to share any document you can view on your computer, not just a PDF but also an x-ray, a spreadsheet, or a CAD drawing. Counsel can also give control to the document over to the witness to page through and perhaps annotate the document as requested. But again, this, this is really important because this is something you have to get comfortable with. It's simple to use, it's simple to work on, but it takes practice and it takes confidence in being able to do this. You will also be able to distribute copies of the exhibits to the other parties as if you were handing out paper copies themselves. The way that you do that uh, depends on the video conferencing platform you use. For example, in Zoom, we have the share function 
and you will be able to utilize that. You can also use a third party file sharing platform like Hallie shared, but again, Council must ensure that the exhibits have been prepped and that they're on the computer that you're using for the video conferencing session. So exhibits introduced at the proceeding can be distributed to all parties by email, by video conference, uh, conferencing file transfer feature like share uh, during the Zoom or by a file sharing platform like Box. And here are some ways that we, here are some options when it comes to annotating the exhibits. So if we are displaying a PDF, you could do, utilize Adobe and the Acrobat tools, and you could also utilize the Zoom annotation tools that are embedded within the Zoom uh, feature. So after the proceeding, the deposition is over. What does everyone do next, right? The core reporter is gonna confirm our orders and collect the witness's email. Um, so that the witness can receive, review, and return the read and sign. The remote videographer, if one was present, will confirm orders and then also ask you if, it's, if the video is to be synchronized to the transcript or unsynchronized. And let's remember, though, in this new abnormal, that the quality of the video will depend on the quality of the witness's webcam, audio, and bandwidth. So if you haven't already submitted the exhibits, now's the time to do it and we recommend renaming the file name to include the exhibit number and then sending the files to the agency. You gotta make sure you understand the security of the platform that you access and because even though we're in a new abnormal remote world, the model rules of professional conduct still applies. You still have a duty to protect your client's information from unauthorized access. So once the core reporter has access to a document, she'll prepare them. Any questions about the exhibits should be between the core reporter and the firm contact. And then finally, the court reporter transmits the final transcript to the agency. And after that, you will be notified as to the manner in which you can access the files on your online software. But really, it's about security. So the technology you use to hold depositions is very important, right? It is the simple slip-ups that can be exploded. Remote proceedings present unique data security. When you work with a court reporting agency, make sure that they're not just jumping on the Zoom train and pivoting to doing remote depositions. You can leave yourself open to slip-ups, and it's these security slip-ups that can damage you and your clients. So ask your agency these questions. How familiar is the agency with the security controls of their conference software? Is the meeting staff, uh, password protected? Can the one-to-one -one chat feature be turned off to prevent the witness from getting coached? Can the video conferencing session be locked at the start of the proceeding? Do they even know how to do that? <laughs> what is the security sent used to protect the documents stored? And how are the exhibits being sent to the reporter? So it is still your responsibility to safeguard client information, and it's your duty to be competent in technology and understand how to use it. So transitioning over to Hallie. Thank you so much. Hallie, you're on mute. We are at the top of, thank you, Karen. We are at the top of the hour. We do have a few questions which we'd like to answer, um, but I would like to thank our host, Legal Fuel, the Practice Resource Institute. And thank you guys so much for attending this webinar. You will be receiving the slides and the CLE code um, in an email following up. And our contact information, Karen, you wanna bring that slide up again, is here with any additional questions. Um, our emails, our cell phone numbers, text us, call us anytime, we're here for you. Um, and then just to answer the questions that, um, that were promoted. So let's see, uh, indicate in the notice of the video deposition that the remote deposition will be taken via Zoom. You can specify Zoom if you'd like, um, that we also suggest the language just saying may be taken using video conferencing technology, but definitely should identify that in the notice and any other remote services that you might consider, like remote videographer, remote interpreter. Um, is Esquire permitting court reporters to attend depositions in person using social distancing? In places where the stay-at-home orders have been lifted, it's my understanding we have. Uh, I know here in Miami, I, 
don't know of any court reporters that are open to it, but they are. There's some in Miami. I just don't know all everywhere. <laughs> um, and then does Esquire offer its own remark court reporter technology? Yes, we offer our, the technology to our court reporters and work with them to ensure that they are up to speed, that they're certified using any technology that we use. Um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, how far in advance does a party scheduling the deposition need to notify Esquire that it will be using a remote reporter? Of course, the earlier the better. <laughs> um, as soon as you are considering it, we like to get involved because of giving demos, providing trainings, and also testing with all the parties. Um, we do ask as soon as possible, um, certainly 48 hours at least, before, um, but we do reach out. And PowerPoint is available, transcript of the Q&A. Um, I'm not sure on the answer on that one, Karen or Jonathan. So the PowerPoint, um, the PowerPoint slides will be sent out with the webinar link. And then in regards to a transcript of the Q&A, we will coordinate with Jonathan to see if that's possible. And if not, then, um, and we will share if need be. But yes, as Hallie shared, um, you know, now more than ever, remote technology is a cornerstone of our new abnormal. And um, to highlight a few, to, it, but it is important to test and to prep and to work together in order to get this right. Thank you, Karen. Again, thank you, Legal Fuel. And thanks to all the amazing attendees. Great questions. Definitely get in touch with us and have a great day. Stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.